Assalamu alaikum. Okay, so we're back. Um, inshallah, the next session is called Faith in Action. And we have two very distinguished speakers for this session. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Imam Abdul Aziz. He is a religious leader at the Salam Islamic Center in Sacramento. Uh, he was educated in, med in medicine, political science, sociology, Islamic history, and Islamic theology. Uh, Imam Aziz holds an MD from Ain Shams University in Cairo, Egypt, a BA from Ohio State University, and an MA from the University of Chicago. He has a special interest in critical reading and analysis of Islamic history, and Imam Aziz has been involved in Islamic activism and education for the past 10 years. He worked with and taught Islam at numerous institutions from the Midwest to the West Coast, he enjoys spending time with his wife and kids and likes to exercise regularly by biking, jogging, weightlifting, and rollerblading. He is also intrigued by all things computer and electronics. So let's welcome uh, Imam Abdul Aziz. We also have joining us uh, Sheikh Abdul Bari Yahya. Uh, he's known as the most laid back and easygoing instructor in the Al Maghrib lineup. He is often used as an example for patients at his best and is famous for hilarious, funny, uh, personal experiences that he uses wittingly to teach and help you remember an Islamic concept. He was born in Vietnam during the Vietnam War, and he immigrated to the U.S. with his family uh, at that time. He grew up in the Seattle area, in the city of Seattle itself, uh, from elementary school onward, and began his studies in Islamic University of Medina. And it was at, the, at that University of Medina that he befriended uh, Muhammad al-Sharif of al maghrib as they sat next to each other in the first year of their studies. After graduating from Islamic University of Medina's College of Sharia, Abdul Bari Yahya returned to Vietnam and Cambodia and became a teacher and director of Umar al a charity organization in Vietnam. He's currently the Imam of Masjid Jameel Muslimin in Seattle. He also holds the position of president of the Champ Refugee Center and the vice president of the board of the Islamic Center of Washington State. So let's welcome Imam Abdul Aziz and Sheikh Abdul Yahya. So the format will be that they'll speak for 15 minutes each, and that will be followed by questions. If you have questions as they're speaking, please write them down, and then maybe we'll have you walk toward the front uh, to ask their questions. Uh, and we'll plan, inshallah, finish by 3.15. So we'll make sure we finish at the right time so that the next uh, session can start on time. So, Salam alaikum warahmatullahi أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So إن شاء الله we have this this talk and there's one more and I wanted to make sure that everyone is still able to follow up with us on on the subject that we've the subjects that we've covered so far. Uh, so uh, again, to refresh our memories, uh, in uh, in Salat al Jum'a, ah, we uh, the the main uh, word that we are supposed to remember is hope uh, from the uh, the opening talk yesterday night. It was the word average uh, from the session uh, this morning at ten. It was leniency. And uh, I, you guys did not attend the youth session. Uh, the word I used was chivalry. Uh, and uh, inshallah ta'ala, let's uh, figure out the word that, uh, that's going to be basically the gist of, um, of this afternoon's talk, inshallah, in the course of the next few minutes. Um, I wanted to focus on, again, another particular quality of the Prophet wasallam that would be suitable for us to use and employ whenever we are working with other people in our wider community because we're talking about faith in action, right? 
And uh, Imam Tahir eloquently mentioned yesterday that we are a society of extremes, right? Uh, people in this country are usually extremes. So you have people who uh, basically are so stubborn and opinionated on the one hand, and then there are those who are so uh, uh, apologetic and everything they say sounds like a question. You know what I'm talking about? Like whenever they're having a conversation with you, everything sounds like a question, right? There's always that tone at the end of their, of their conversation. They're not sure, right, if what they're saying is the right thing or not. So they always are apologetic in almost every, um, everything they do. And Islam strikes a balance between extremes, okay? That is the, one of the main points uh, for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought Islam to this world as the Quran says وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَى لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ And as such we have made you into a middle of the road nation. Uh, a, a, a nation that possesses no extremes. So Islam strikes a balance between, for example, what is the, what is the exact opposite of being cowardly? What is the opposite of cowardly? Is the opposite of cowardly brave? No, brave is the proper state of affairs that you should possess. What is the, pro what, what is the right opposite of, of cowardice? I, I didn't hear that. Heroes is being heroic uh, a, a, a bad thing because I said Islam is a balance between two extremes. So automatically the two extremes are bad. If one extreme is cowardice, then the other extreme is? Aggressiveness, maybe. I, I would say the word foolhardiness. How about foolhardy? To be so uh, um, out of control and you turn that bravery into something destructive, right? Foolhardy. So Islam wants you to be brave and courageous. Doesn't want you to be a coward and doesn't want you to be foolhardy. Okay? What about spending? On the one extreme, there is stinginess. What is the other extreme? Extravagance. And Islam wants you to be, what's the proper word? Frugal. They use it. They use the word frugal. Okay? So you strike a balance between extremes. Even in your salah, like the Quran uh, talks about when you pray by yourself. وَلَا تَجْهَرْ بِصَلَاتِكَ وَلَا تُخَافِتْ بِهَا when you pray by yourself, not behind the Imam, when you're praying by yourself, Salat al Sunnah, or you pray Fard at home by yourself, you're not supposed to be loud that other people could hear you, and you're not supposed to be so silent either, or so uh, uh, faint in, in, in your recitation that you can't hear yourself. So it has to be whispering that you can hear, but if someone is standing next to you, that person cannot hear it. Islam wants to strike a, a balance between extreme exercise, for example. There are people in our community that are just exercise freaks. What is the opposite of being an exercise freak? What's that? Couch potato, exactly. Thank you. That's the exact word I had written here, actually. <laughs> the extreme between couch potato and, uh, and the other extreme is... Um, is being an exercise freak. Islam wants you to be moderate in your exercise, you know, somewhere um, in between. What about arrogance? What is the exact opposite of arrogance? Meekness, right? You're supposed to have your own personality. You're supposed to have your own opinions and to express those opinions, but you're not supposed to be arrogant about them, okay? Now, I wanted to talk to you about a quality of the Prophet's life, sallallahu alayhi wasallam that has to do with striking that balance that I feel if you use when you interact with other people and it will help you put your faith in action. And this is again not something that you read in books. This is an experience of years and years of working with people. There is that one sublime quality of the Prophet ﷺ that they collectively call الذوق. الذوق. How many heard this word before? ذوق. One Two, I mean, we don't have that. Three. We don't have that many people, but in this room, only three people heard of the word dhawq. And here's your word for this session. Elegance. The word is elegance. Dhawq is to be elegant. What do I mean by this from an Islamic standpoint? 
There are three particular notions, and I'm just describing it to you, and inshallah, I'll give you an example or examples so you understand what that actually means. Dhawq has to do with three things, and if you're writing this, this is the, you have to write this stuff down. Number one, class. You know, they say someone has class, right? What is class? If you have class, that means you're striking a balance between two extremes. One of them is pretentiousness. Someone who's so pretentious, right? So in class, you strike a balance between pretentiousness and on the other extreme, they actually call this uh, 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 austerity. You remember last year when President Obama was talking about austerity measures, right? To be austere, to tighten the belts. So Islam wants you to be someone that has, that has preferences in your taste, right? And to be selective and to want certain qualities in your life. But you never allow that to be very pretentious. And you never allow that to be completely austere. That you are the, the very hard Muslim. See, let me give you an example. For, if you invite someone for dinner, for instance. And you tell that person, what is your preference? What would you like to eat? No, alhamdulillah, don't worry. Anything. I, I enjoy anything. Can you at least tell me like one particular cuisine? Is there a particular type of food that you enjoy? No, Allah, you know, I like all kinds of food. It is so hard to work with people like this. Just give them whatever. And, and, and it sounds like it's easy, but again, the Prophet ﷺ had his preferences. What was the Prophet's preference in meat? Which part of the meat the Prophet ﷺ enjoyed the most? Shoulder, the shoulder blade meat, right? Lahmul katif. He used to enjoy that. Right? He had his own subtle preferences that represented his class as a human being. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Versus the other guy who represents the other extreme. Which kind of food uh, do you enjoy? Uh, do you guys have any Norwegian uh, restaurants in town? <laughs> and if you somehow miraculously found the Norwegian restaurant, they look at the menu, ah, it doesn't have the, that one thing I ate in Norway last year. So you strike a balance in, in terms of your taste right in terms of your class between those two extremes pretentiousness and austerity another dimension of class of, of uh, um, or, or that elegance the prophetic elegance i call it um, is to be sensitive when you interact with other people and sensitivity here implies that whatever you do or say uh, it does not offend people right so it's not harsh it's not offensive it is not degrading on the other hand, it is not schmoozing to them or kissing up to them either. You see what I'm saying? This is where you strike the balance. Number three is good taste. You appreciate some sublime qualities of life. So it's okay to say, I prefer to drive a Toyota or, or a Lexus or a BMW. As the Imam said uh, uh, earlier this morning, Imam Tahir. Right? It's okay to enjoy you know, a particular sublime pleasures of life. If it's coming from your halal uh, earnings, this is perfectly fine. As long as you strike a balance between two extremes. One of them is a complete lack of preferences. You shouldn't do that. And the other one is to be so stuck on brand names and, and designer products and stuff like that, that it's just you become a, 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 a problem in of yourself as a human being. I know, for example, uh, 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 one sister in our community who only wear, carries a particular purse and she has to buy a new purse every two years and it's like $10,000 purse. It's $10,000, right, at Nordstrom. And my wife told me about it and I was so curious. So next time we were at the mall, I actually went to Nordstrom to look it up. And it was true, it was $10,000, okay? There was this, uh, my, my brother lives in Qatar, in Doha. And he has a Qatari partner. And you know, the, many Qataris are very, very wealthy people. And he's a really nice guy, he's the nicest guy. But he sent, sent me an email and he's asking me to help him purchase a, a, a purse for his wife that is $27,000. Wallahi, I did not know that such things exist. He forwarded a website to me and I looked, looked the, through, through the website and there were purses and suits and, and uh, women accessories and stuff that reached $100,000. There is a market, it's, but by the way, just for your information, for your amusement, let's say the website is, 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 is called 
firstdibs.com. One S T D I B S dot com. Just go there and be amazed as I was. I, I did not ex- even know that such culture existed where people purchase such expensive things. It's ridiculous. But Islam allows you and encourages you to have taste as long as you keep that taste within a certain limit. Now, why am I bringing this up in, in, in a discussion about faith in action? As I said, we live in this society of extremes. Uh, between people who are basically homeless, who would settle for whatever piece of bread that they find in, in the garbage can, and people who are so extreme, right, where they can only ride this car, can only live in that neighborhood, who have very, very strict preferences. It's a, it's, it's a strange society. And by the way, I'm not casting any moral judgment on either group. I am just saying that Muslims need to stand out between those two groups in our You have to stand out. What is it that you bring to the table that other people don't, right? What kind of moral value do you provide the society in which you live that other people lack to provide? Let's examine the character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as far as the three dimensions of dhawq, of elegance, that I talked about. How are we supposed to give advice to people? Like if someone, uh, and this happens at the Masajid Wa, okay? Someone prays the wrong way at the Masjid. Uh, and you know, let's say the sisters are you know, praying in the rows and they see that one sister who's just doing it wrong. What do we do? If you think that we need to talk to her, like talk to the Imam and have the Imam uh, mention the sister's name in the microphone and correct her in front of everyone, raise your hand. Uh, anybody? No? Didn't think so. If you think that three sisters need to gang up on her and take her to the corner after Isha and tell her what she did wrong, raise your hand. No? Nobody? Okay. If you think you should completely ignore it, and not even mention it and let her learn over the years, raise a hand. Okay. If you think that one sister needs to go talk to her privately or send her an email and tell her what she did wrong, raise your hand. Okay, very good. If you understand English, raise your hand. <laughs> it's like a look at Because some people just would not raise their hands about anything. What? Um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would do none of that. None of the above. None of the above. Now we're getting confused, right? Here it is. There was that one incident in which um, one of the companions, so they all prayed uh, uh, um, Zuhr together. And it was, you know, about half an hour before Asr. So they prayed Zuhr together. And uh, uh, they ate camel meat. And in the midst of the Sahaba, one of them broke his wudu and let out gas loudly. Loudly. So they were looking at each other. Right. And the Prophet ﷺ knew that one of them did that and it was embarrassing. Now here's the challenge. They were about to pray Asr. And... One person is going to leave the, the crowd and go make wudu, right? And then everyone is going to be pointing at, ah, oh, it was you, huh? I knew it. I knew it's going to be this guy. So the Prophet ﷺ wanted to save this brother from the embarrassment. So what does he say, ﷺ? He says, Man akala lahma jazurin If any of you ate camel meat today, all of you need to make wudu. It's genius. It's just genius, right? Save the brother from the embarrassment and just show everyone a beautiful lesson and test in brotherhood. So what is the proper way, again, faith in action, what is the proper way to give advice? You don't take the person to the corner. You don't make a public announcement. You don't make a private announcement. You don't send an email. You don't update your Facebook status and tag him. Right? What are you supposed to do? Make general indirect comments at a later date, a later time, and hope that that person will get the point very indir- indirectly. Does that make sense? That was the way of the Prophet 
One, uh, uh, one other uh, lesson in class that is, you know, definitely faith in action. We always see people uh, talking to each other in the presence of a third person. So if you have two and there's a third person in the room, it's against the sunnah for two people to talk to each other and ignore the third, right? Uh, and this is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. We don't do that anymore, but there's one thing that we always do that would offend that third person. And that is when two guys talk to each other in a different language. So you have three people, two of them are Arab and the third person is, is, is Pakistani or convert or whatever it is. They don't speak Arabic, right? So they keep going, and they crack their jokes in Arabic. And then they're laughing so hard and this is guy just sitting in the corner like, what's so funny? Do you guys want to share with me like the translation, roughly speaking, of the joke? And this is extremely offensive to people. It is part of a faith and action to use the class and the elegance of the Prophet ﷺ and never do this. And some people ask me, what if, it's, what if I invite like 20 families at my place? The, out of the 20 families, 19 families are Pakistani and there's that one Palestinian family in there. What do we do? We need to talk to each other in Urdu. My response is always, that there's one person, not one family, one person in the room that doesn't understand the language, you shouldn't speak in that language. So all of you need to speak English if there's only one person that doesn't, that doesn't understand the language you're using, right? This is an extremely important uh, prophetic advice. One more example, the Qur'an says, uh, speaks to the believers uh, and, and basically says you're not supposed to enter someone's house unless you do two things. حَتَّى تَسْتَأْنِسُ وَتُسَلِّمُ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِهَا Until you basically make sure that they actually want you as a visitor, that they like you, and then next, to salimu means that you say salam before you enter. See the, the extreme of sensitivity that the Qur'an teaches uh, the believers. And, I, and I, again, I, this is what I want us to do. I'm just giving you very few examples, grazing the surface. You take the, the, the qualities of the Prophet Sallallahu and translate them into practical steps that you can actually start exercising on a regular basis with your friends, with your families, with your acquaintances, and so on and so forth. And one last thing, inshallah ta'ala, with, with your emails. Okay, this is again faith in action. With your emails, and I know that someone, you received this message that angered you so much. Okay, so you roll your sleeves, and you sit down and you just pour your anger into that email message. Have you done that before? I do this all the time. But you know what I do? I don't click send. I let it sit in my out box for a day at least. And then I come back the next day and I read it and I'm like, oh my God. How did I say this? And immediately I click delete. Okay? Once it gets out, you can't take it back. Okay? So be sensitive with people, you treat them with, with the class and the elegance of the Prophet Wasallam. Again, this is a little bit similar to rift, to leniency that I was talking about earlier, but this is again about just making the proper choices fitting and being most suitable to the proper circumstances. Jazakum uh, 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 for uh, giving us the opportunity to share this with you. Uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, hear what Imam Abdul Bari has to say. Jazakum uh, Khairan, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullah. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام 
إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in hadith in Musnad Imam Ahmad and it is a very powerful hadith in its meaning. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said إِذَا قَامَتِ السَّاعَةِ If the Day of Judgment were to occur and the Day of Judgment is happening وَفِي يَدِي أَحَدِكُمْ فَصِيلًا And you have a seedling in your hand if he is able to plant that seedling, then let him do so. Subhanallah. I want you to think and reflect about that. Look at the, imagine the scenery. Look at the scene. The day of judgment is happening. And you have a seedling in your hand. If you put that seedling into the ground, what happens to it? One moment later, it's destroyed. One moment only. Because the day of judgment is occurring. You only have that final moment. But if you're able to do a good deed, then do so right now. And so, not even the day of, a, of judgment is, a, is an excuse for us not to contribute and benefit society. Some of us, the reason why I'm mentioning this hadith is because many of us, we say, what difference can I do? What can I make? What difference can I, what change can I bring forth? I am just one person. So this particular hadith is a reminder for all of us and it refutes the, the excuse of those who say, what difference can I make? in such a powerful way because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He is the one that knows what's in our hearts and any little action that we may put forth Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will magnify it and so the results you leave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but whatever you can contribute whatever you can do you do it Especially living in this society. You know, one of, uh, one of the du'ats, one of the scholars, when, when, my, when a friend of mine sat down, he was telling me the story and he spoke to him. He's very well known. Very well known in the West. He said, after 9-11 if you were to know what was going to happen what would you have done differently to prepare the Muslims for what was to come what would you have done differently so he said I would have done more I would have done more teach the Muslims to be proactive to show the true faith of, faith of Islam because a lot of times nowadays we're always waiting for something happen and then we are reactive instead of being proactive when we when we are living here in the United States of America some people they come and they ask you and they say sure should we go back to our countries? Like those who do have Muslim countries they can go back, or should I stay here? You know, when they ask me that question, I tell them a story. Once a year, and sometimes once every two years, I go back and make Hajj, and I see some of my teachers. I remember I had, um, when I returned, in one of the years, I was sitting with one of my teachers in the, in the Prophet's Masjid. And I asked him, oh, I said, MashaAllah, we're sitting next to the, you know, next to the grave of the, the Messenger of Allah, just behind the Rawdah. 
and there's this cool breeze that's coming. And I said, MashaAllah, you're so blessed to be here in the city of the Prophet And he looked at me and said, no, you're so blessed. You're the one that's really blessed to be living in America. Not that he wants to come to America for the dunya purposes, no. He said, every single day, you have the opportunity to have people say, La ilaha illallah. And your actions, and your da'wah, when you call people to Islam, and when you're speaking to people, just being a Muslim, you have to understand that right now you're at the frontier of the Muslim ummah. And so, most people outside right now, they're not going to be reading the Qur'an. The only Qur'an that they're going, they're going to be reading is our, act, our, our, our actions. And that's why we have to embody the teachings of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and the teachings in the Qur'an and the Sunnah in our daily lives. Because every day, when we go out there, whether you want to or not, you're making da'wah. And you're representing Islam and the Muslims. Whether you like it or not. And so you might say, well, should I go back to my country? No, you shouldn't. You should stay here. Because you're at the, Muslim, the forefront of the Muslim ummah. Unless you are being influenced so greatly that you're losing your children, your deen and so forth. Yes, you go. But as long as you still have a place to worship Allah, and you have the opportunity to worship Allah, and call people to this deen, La ilaha illallah, and represent Islam and the Muslims at the frontier of the Islamic ummah, the Islamic da'wah, then you stay here. And that's why Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, he was the one who hosted the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was on his deathbed in Turkey and they were fighting the people there and so he gave he advised the people around him he said when I die I want you to take my body deep into enemy territory and I want you to bury me there you might ask, why? Why does he want to be buried with in, in, the, in the area where the non-Muslims are living? Right? He said, so that on the day of judgment, when Allah asks me, why were you raised there? Oh, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. Oh, Abu Ayyub. He said, I can, so I can say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, I died there carrying la ilaha illallah. And if they were to all just stay and relax in Medina, then we wouldn't have La ilaha illallah right now in America, sitting our seats right now. The greatest blessing that we have. And that's why whether we like it or not, we have to embody the teachings of Islam, and we have to be the best Muslims that we can be. Not only do we have to just be the best Muslim, we also have to be proactive. We have to be the first people. We have to be the first people at the, the lines where they're passing, and we have, to, we have to be the ones passing out things that the needy, the homeless, we have to be there when the battered women are in their shelters and they need help. We have to be there when, the cal when calamities occur. So that the other people will see the human aspect, aspect of Muslims. That you know, these people are kind. These people are generous. And then like I said before, it will not matter what CNN or Fox, they can say whatever they want. Because the people will see the actions of the Muslims. And so we have to start being proactive. Don't wait for another 9-11 and say we should have done this and we should have done that. No, this is the time right now. This is the time to show others what Islam really is. 
so that your neighbors will know what true Islam is, who a true Muslim is. So you have to be exceptional. You can't be normal. You can't be exceptional. You have to be exceptional to the point where people are coming to you. And they're saying, why are you so honest? Why are you so kind? Why did you mow my lawn also every time you mow your own lawn? And then you tell him, because this is what Islam teaches me. Do you want to know what Islam is? And that's what Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam did even in prison. Why did the people come to him? Why did the two prisoners come to him? They came to him because he was exceptional. And that's why when they came to him, they said, Inna naraka min al muhsineen Indeed, we, sh- we saw that you were amongst those who did good, who were kind. Muhsineen. They were, the be- the, they were excellent and kind to the others. And, uh, and he took the opportunity to call them to La ilaha illallah. And so, our actions, our kindness, our words, our honesty, all of this is, is da'wah. And living in America, we have to represent Islam correctly. And if we do that, inshallah, then no matter what happens, later on, the people will know what true Islam is. And so you take advantage of the opportunity to be here. And we should thank, thank Allah subhanahu that we have the opportunity to be here and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, don't say that I can't make a difference. You can make a difference. Every one of us here, in the masjid, in the community. So we have to start our social programs for the neighbors around the masjid. That's why we have some masjids that are closed because, because we don't have good relations with the people around us. And so that's why we also, you know, we have to work and start with our character. And then we also have to go forward and be proactive, not be reactive. Don't wait for something to happen. We have to show people first. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in, in the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you see his, his actions in his face. When you, when you are practicing Islam, and when you're kind to others, when you love others, it makes a big difference. That's why some, unfortunately a lot of us, inshallah, I'll end it with this, a lot of us, we think that the face of piety and righteousness is that face of the of that, that uncle that comes to the masjid with that serious face like that's mashallah, that's the face that's, that's the face, face of piety and righteousness no that was not the face of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in fact he always had a smile in his face that's why Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu he said the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam every time he would look at me he would have he would always have a smile on his face so much so that I even approached the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, he thought that he was the best. He thought that he was the, the favorite of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. So he went to him and he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, am I better than Abu Bakr or is Abu Bakr better than me? Subhanallah. See that smile on his face was such a special smile. It made everyone feel special. Such a glowing smile. He thought he was better than, he, he thought that he was the best. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, no, Abu Bakr is better than you. <laughs> of course, everyone knows the status of Abu Bakr, right? Radiallahu anhu. Everybody knows his status. But you know what? Amr ibn As still remembered the smiles of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. Every time he looked at him, so much so that he tried again. He said, oh, Messenger of Allah, is Abu Bakr, is Umar better than me? Or am I better than Umar? Subhanallah. 
The Prophet said, Omar is better than you. And then he said, after that, I realize that the Messenger of Allah is like this to everyone. You know what? Sometimes some of our neighbors, the neighbors of the Masajis and our neighbors, when they, they, they actually, I remember receiving an email, right? So, about one of the neighbors, I think, Arsalan, did you send it last time about a, a, a woman who was complaining? Or may, I think uh, one of the brothers did, I remember. Uh, she used to live next to the masjid, right? And she, always, she was always trying to say hello, hi, and so forth. But everyone was like, had this frown on their face all the time. And she thought maybe it was, it was just maybe the men, right? But when she tried it with the woman, and she was, she'd been there for many, for, for, for years next to the masjid. But it was the same even with the woman also. Everyone had the same attitude. This was not the attitude of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He always had a smile on his face, such a glowing smile that said, I love you and I care for you. I want the best for you. And so the smile or that frown on the face, that serious face and so forth. Of course there's a time for seriousness but most people think that's the face of piety and righteousness. No, the, pi pi the face of piety and righteousness is that kind face towards your Muslim brothers and sisters, towards your non-Muslim neighbors, your co-workers, your classmates that makes others love you. And then when people speak badly about Muslims, they say, no, I know a Muslim. He always had a smile on his face. He was the kind, most kind of all my friends. He was the most generous, the most honest, the most hardworking of anyone that I knew. And it will not matter what CNN, Fox, CBC, ABC, or whatever network will say, because your actions will speak so loud, they will not be able to hear what anyone says. Um, I think we have, do we have time for Q&A or should we begin the next session after this? Okay, um, if, you, if you do have questions, if you can hold them and then hopefully we can get them answered in the next session. Uh, but we'll end the session here and it, it, we'll take a five minute break and, and after five minutes, uh, the next session will start and that will uh, be moderated by Brother Heather Ali and uh, we'll be joined by Imam Abdul Aziz and Imam uh, Tahir Anwar. So inshallah in five minutes, we'll start the next session.